Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. I assume you received my email about class today. Um, yeah, I came onto campus and was walking across campus to my office and already I could feel it in my lungs. Um, I have asthma and I had COVID last year, which I think has worsened, <laughs> um, you know, has less, left some scarring. So, you know, and it was going to be a challenge to try to lecture in that little room through my mask and the smoke and the noise of construction and so on. Um, I'm already feeling kind of af awful <laughs> as a result of all the smoke. Um, so I did want to just go over the readings and some of the things to think about um, for the exam next week. So the exam next week um, it will be on it will be on gaucho space. Uh, it will be a short multiple choice uh, uh, quiz exam exam um, and it will primarily focus on different aspects of research design. So you know, I will provide a study guide tomorrow um, that you can use. It will be a list of kind of terms that, that, that will be defined. Um, you'll also want to know what research design did such and such researcher use, and that will be laid out in the syllabus. And so we'll cover um, the readings, and I'm especially interested in, you know, your ability to recognize the research design, sampling techniques, all of these things um, in the articles themselves. So to kind of start off this amazing book with this beautiful cover, Smart Growth Entrepreneurs, um, I asked you to read chapter one. And so you learned about how optimistic I was about um, housing development and, and so on. And I think I may have mentioned, you know, that I grew up in in the Midwest, in uh, Nebraska, where there's an abundance of land and, you know, we're not quite hemmed in by the same um, <coughs> geographic, geographic, um, the same geography um, as you see in, in California and in Oregon. So I decided to look at when I was developing this study, you know, I was, I was just sort of interested in, okay, how do sustainable developments happen and you know, what's going on there and I was interested in regional approaches and you know kind of because I started I, be, I, I used grounded theory and started with this growth machine and calling it a smart growth machine but also uh, using different theories as as my research progressed um, <clears throat> So I kind of go through and talk about, you know, some of the aspects of uh, the the programs and people that I was looking at. Um, I, you know, kind of discuss some of these, uh, some, some of the projects that I look at and some of the places and so on. All of this is sort of introductory stuff. This is where I get into the background theory, and here I'm talking about the Austrian School of Economics, generally kind of a libertarian school of thought, you know, keep government out, markets know best, uh, that kind of thing. This came in handy because I interviewed, as I'll discuss uh, later, I interviewed a, a president of a libertarian think tank who was an environmentalist and was just as passionate about the environment, but didn't think that government knew what to do best. And so, so anyway, I just wanted to make sure that I had my, my bases covered, you know, reading all this uh, economic theory um, and so on. I'm not going to go through all this for you, but <coughs> you see that what often happens when you do a research study is you have to look at the research that's been done beforehand. Um, we call this a literature review, and then you find the gaps that are there, or you try to build upon the study, or you try to replicate it, as I've uh, talked about in a previous previous class. So then I look at another kind of school of theory, urban political economy. Um, this kind of is born out of the more Marxist perspective, though it's not necessarily Marxist, but generally disagrees with the Austrian school of economics that you can have a self-regulating market that basically um, 
there's always going to be government, there's always going to be regulation uh, of some sort. And so urban political economy then is try to, trying to understand power within urban areas. And so here you see the growth machine uh, developed. And also you see Robert Dahl, a famous political scientist, dead political scientist, um, came up with his term political entrepreneur. Again, when we're thinking about metaphors and things like that. Uh, to, he used it to describe these sort of political leaders who innovate and do something you know, radically new. Excuse me. <clears throat> <All right. clears throat> who innovate and um, you know do something radically new in terms of policy uh, and and things like that. And you know I'm just going through the literature review. If you look at the the bibliography for this um for this book, I think it's. 17 pages long or something like that at least my dissertation it was and this book basically comes out of my dissertation um, I also talked about this new field of green building studies uh, that some of you actually might be interested in where they kind of you know recognize the importance of both markets and you know sensible uh, government actions whether that be regulations of some sort or incentives to build more sustainably uh, and and so on. So I kind of used the green building perspectives as well. Whoops, where did I go now? Okay, the smart growth entrepreneurs. Now, here is where I lay out this concept that I've you know kind of developed in the course of my research. So this is a again a good time to keep in mind that when we talk about qualitative research, we're talking about inductively gathering theory inductively creating theory. What does that mean? We're not deductively uh, uh, creating theory. So it, basically inductive means that it's more subjective. We're taking a lot of information from a lot of different places and trying to you know, put it in to <clears throat> make sense of it all, how, 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 it, how it comes together. Uh, a more deductive approach would be like a causal analysis in, uh, in statistics where you're trying to see what causes, you know, what to happen and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So growth, smart growth entrepreneurs, I recognized pretty early on that public private partnerships uh, played a pretty big role. And you often saw in cities like Santa Barbara and so on that you had, you know, members of the government, the city government, or who are uh, working with developers and architects who are trying to build uh, more, more sustainability, more sustainably. Now, 20, on page 22, here's where we get to the important stuff of this class, uh, the research design, you know, and I kind of uh, discuss, discuss my reasoning for it and, you know, look at uh, some of the past research. A couple urban sociologists have argued for what they call a socio-spatial perspective that basically stops looking at individual cities, which was this bad habit <laughs> that urban sociologists had for the last hundred years or so of, you know, just looking at Chicago, just looking at New York, just looking at LA, just looking at, you know, Portland or whatever. And <clears throat> so I kind of build on this multi-stage selection from this, uh, this urban sociologist, I forget his name, his first name Sellers, but he did, did this study comparing France, Germany, and the, the United States. Um, so I did that as well I, <clears throat> by, by, uh, by comparing two different states. Now I'll just go to the chart that shows my basic research design um, and method. So for your paper, you're going to make something that looks like, <coughs> excuse me, that might look something like this. It will probably look different because you may have a different uh, paper. So kind of, you know, as you <coughs> look at articles and go through the readings, you may want to look at some of these tables uh, to, to sh 
to look at to see how they are constructing their research design and how they're presenting it for uh, the to, in a way that makes sense to to the reader. So here we've got the units of analysis, those that sort of multi-stage selection, so states and cities, data collection, regions chosen from two states, so California and Oregon, you know, in the sample um, here, California, Oregon. The analysis, uh, well, I used census data to find out about occupational data, you know, just kind of demographic stuff, um, maps to look at, you know, the topography and, uh, if possible, the ecological and water resources uh, in the area. And then also, the other thing that I looked at were 11 cities in California and Oregon. Um, they were in these two regions. And, you know, how did I analyze them? Well, I visited the sites. I went to those uh, cities and and visited the sites of these new urbanist projects because I was interested in these projects that I talked about and I think I even drew a little picture of the built these buildings that have housing above and commercial space uh, on on the bottom and the first thing you have to do if you're doing a comparative study is you know, make sure that what you're looking at is relatively similar across the different cases. So I couldn't look at one of these, say, new urbanist projects and just randomly compare it to like, you know, like a single family home in Santa Maria or something like that. Uh, so I was looking specifically for these, these, uh, these parameters, you know, mixed use, um, high density development, transit oriented, that sort of thing. Um, and to do that, this is where, you know, it's not quantitative, but numbers do come in quite heavily. Uh, I collected building permits from these 11 cities uh, over 10 years and basically went through thousands of building permits and identified, you know, nine projects that specifically fit, fit my uh, description. There had been others that were built in the 1990s, uh, but I was interested in this period because, well, you just just made the data easier in some ways. So four of these were in Oregon and then seven of them uh, were in California. I ended up interviewing 28 people. 26 people agreed to have their interviews recorded. Uh, the, I mean, I'm sorry, 26, did I say? 26 agreed to be recorded and two uh, did not, were not recorded. And then it says the codes were inductive were uh, inductively generated. So one thing that you see in uh, a lot of qualitative research is coding. You have to figure out some way in which you know you can compare these interviews with different people who are answering very differently and kind of going on the, their own tangents. And so you know I noticed that. Early on in my research, it became pretty clear that the commercial spaces on the bottom were not filling up and that this was a problem financially for um, a lot of these developers and property owners and so on. Um, and a number of them went bankrupt as a, as a result. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I developed codes then for, you know, a certain color when I was highlighting for every time that I saw, um, you know, mention of commercial property, you know, struggles or something like that, or code and different color or whatever, however you're, you're doing it, um, for every time that I heard about uh, CEQA, the, Cent the California Environmental Quality Act, which every development must go through CEQA in order to be approved. Um, so things like that, you, you code for it, then you go back through, and we won't be using it in this class, but in, um, you know, if this was, if there was like a part two to this class, uh, we would probably start using NVivo um, or other types of qualitative software. So these are software programs that will essentially do the coding for you and, you know, numerically, and they're all pretty cool and fun and stuff. And um, for whatever reason, I ended up not deciding not to use the, that for my uh, dissertation. Then, so I have another table 
looking at these projects themselves, looking at the sustainable developments themselves, you know, where they're located, roughly, uh, you know, how, how large they were, number of units, uh, cost, and, you know, how there's some places where it's just missing information, where I just couldn't get the, the information that I, uh, that I needed. And then here I've got the, the list of participants who I interviewed. Um, as you can see, you know, a range of people from real estate lawyers, uh, architects, you know, former mayors, city planners, and uh, so on and so forth. Again, this is a relatively small sample, especially considering I'm looking at several uh, different regions. However, uh, and this is something to keep in mind, qualitative research takes longer to do. Uh, it takes a while to gather the data, to you know, schedule an interview, conduct that interview, code it, and so on and so forth. So anyway, um, ideally you would, you know, a study like this, I would have liked to have had maybe twice as many people interviewed, but they still presented uh, incredibly useful information. So again, I, I decided to include a, a timeline. You know, I did, this was not necessary um, for the study, but I thought it would be good um, to put everything in perspective. And I'm sort of a historical thinker, and you know, I think it's important to see okay how these things have evolved uh, over time. So you know, I start with you know what you know housing construction and automobile sprawl and everything would not be possible without oil and so i start with uh, the start the timeline in 1896 with the world's first offshore oil drilling exploration uh just here nearby in summerland um talk about how la was the first uh, city in the nation to to uh, enact a zoning ordinance. So zoning, you know, you can only build commercial uh, projects in, in this zone, only residential over here, that kind of thing. Um, and then you just see a number of things that are important for my broader project. Population growth is, is happening. This thing called the master plan gets developed in California and in Oregon. Then in 1969, you get the oil spill in uh, Santa Barbara, you know, and then going more recently, these these start to get into um, the projects that, uh, that that I was examining and, you know, when they were built and their completion. But I wanted to provide the broader history and, you know, kind of make sure that we understood that that these developments are happening in states that have a long history of, you know, conservation, environmental activism, but also of a lot of development and a lot of, you know, destruction of habitat and so on. Um, <clears throat> so again, that's something you may want to think of. It's not, you know, it's not required, but, you know, depending on what your project is, maybe some, you know, maybe it, something falls under CEQA, the um, California Environmental Quality Act, and so maybe you may want to talk about when that was passed and why that matters, and so on. So anyway, um, that's kind of the main, uh, that's the gist of my research, for, or at least what you need to know uh, for now. And I should say that, as I said, this was all kind of inductively. I found these projects by um, looking at thousands of building permits. And to be honest, after looking at 11 cities and going through these projects, I have to say I was a little disappointed uh, that I only found a f very few uh, projects that fit uh, this, that, that fit these, the, the criteria that I was looking for. Um, that, you know, according to the research, is some of the most sustainable building you can do. Uh, so even in, you know, a place like Santa Barbara um, or the, the, the suburbs of Portland that are very progressive and into green building and so on, yeah, in 2000 to 2010 at least, you didn't see a lot of that. Um, if, you know, someone were willing to fund me to do research, I might want to. Um, I'm not going this Anyway, my wife telling me that Phoebe Bridgers has a new song out. I don't, anyway, <laughs> not sure why that <laughs> why that's coming out right now. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, 
my wife is trying to <laughs> trying to contact me and it's showing up on my uh, laptop okay so anyway now you know that I'm a fan of Phoebe Bridgers I guess <clears throat> all right so um that's kind of the gist of, of, of that article I did also want to discuss the article it never rains in california constructions of drought as a natural and social phenomenon so this was a kind of interesting study <clears throat> it was an interesting study because it was done by a couple of people from uh, the uk who came to california to, to examine drought you know sometimes it's good to have that distance uh, you can be perhaps more objectively and they interviewed 71 people um, in the course of 10 weeks uh, in 2015 in, 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 in urban and rural uh, parts of the state. So they were looking at the drought in 2012 to 2014, and I remember that. That was roughly, I left Santa Barbara in uh, September or August of 2014, and I remember having a garden and just looking very sad for the last uh, few years that we were uh, here in here in Santa Barbara. So anyway, this study can be useful for perhaps helping us understand um, understand the drought now and it can also kind of help you kind of think about crafting your own uh, research. So again, starts off with the, the literature review, you know, the drought got a lot of national news coverage, there's a lot of Google trends, um, people looking up uh, stuff about droughts and so on. <clears throat> and they've talked about, and here I think is a really key part of their, their study, and uh, they say that some qualitative studies of drought experience have been carried out in Australia, a very drought-prone region. There has been little corresponding qualitative research in our, uh, in the USA. So if those of you who may go off and do research someday, um, there's, you know, here's a big research project that's just waiting to be done. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, qualitative research, not a lot, looking at people's attitudes. There's been surveys, a lot of surveys, which are helpful. But again, as we've talked about, you can sometimes get, uh, you know, into, into deeper and richer data using qualitative uh, approaches. <clears throat> My voice is already getting bad from the smoke. Okay, um, so, and this is <clears throat> their, their sample, so um, they got, they interviewed 71 people and it was, a, it was what we would call a convenient sample. <clears throat> convenient sample, you know, say you're doing a survey, you interview everyone on your uh, dorm floor or something like that, you know, because it's convenient. Uh, this is a convenient sample. They just kind of approach people on the cafe, at cafes and public spaces and so on, or email people in some cases. So, you know, clearly not a representative sample. You could have oversampled, say, the elderly or, you know, Democrats or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but nevertheless, it's still 71 people uh, giving their, their accounts of, of the drought. And so they kind of talk about uh, the research and how they, you know, didn't really have um, fixed, you know, a, a lot of fixed guidelines, you know, really wanting to make sure they had more than, you know, 30 people. Usually in qualitative research, we want 30 people, not for your project when we're not expecting like a, you know, a research article to come out of, well, a research article can come out of this, but it's uh, not expected. Um, if you choose to do, do interviews, they'll be um, much, uh, much shorter. So the other thing I, that I didn't highlight that I'll highlight now, uh, where is my highlighter? That's not my highlighter. Here's my highlighter. Okay. Sorry. Um, this semi-structured interview. So this is what I did when I interviewed people. Like a structured interview, you just have the questions and you're just not deviating from those questions. It's very structured. Semi-structured, you have maybe a list of those questions, 
but you also bring up other questions in response to their answer. So, um, so and then maybe you'll get back around to the questions that you have written down. Uh, but it's semi-structured in the sense that, yeah, you've got these questions you want to cover, but you know you're open to other things that may come up uh, during the research process. So they, um, as they said, they were primarily interested in um, people's experience of the droughts and they come up, they identify these different uh, conceptions. I sh should say, first of all, uh, yeah, so they get their transcripts and then they coded, code them using this program in vivo, um, <clears throat> which is a data data driven approach. This is different than what I did this. I, uh, my research, I used it with well, <laughs> a pre existing coding frame and th theoretical preconception. So, like the growth machine, I use the smart growth machine, um, that kind of thing. So, thinking about that, um, you know, the growth machine in, in a city, well, what if it wants sustainable growth? Um, that was really kind of my, my driving motivation. So theme one, conceptions of normality, it's just kind of like, yeah, there's fires. I mean, there's a fire right now and, you know, saw people out jogging and walking their dogs as it smelled, um, you know, the air was thick with smoke. I can even smell it in here. And this is actually, I mean, uh, the social building in my office is actually one of the newer and better ventilated buildings on campus. Um, so anyway. <clears throat> And just bear with me. I think I might try to get through as much of this um, article as I can. Here's the interview schedule that they have. So basically, you know, roughly the questions that they were asking there. Um, then location, you know, inside versus outside. They found that people in cities would often talk about the weather. Um, people who lived in rural areas would often talk about, you know, the landscape changing. I know if, you know, those of you from around here, um, you know, next time you drive north on the 101, uh, Refugio Canyon is going to look different um, than it did before. And I'm sure the ranchers out there are, you know, notice the difference. So again, people in the cities feel uh, less affected by it than the case than is the case uh, for rural places. And so, you know, the researcher put in a table with some of the participants and their responses. <coughs> <Yeah. clears throat> I have to put on my mask in here. Um, and um, so anyway, that's something you could think about doing. Obviously, these aren't all their responses, but these are um, perhaps the most illustrative ones. These are kind of key to uh, the point that the researcher is making. So another theme were the emotional responses that people had. Fear, um, that's, you know, obviously one, you know, is that fire going to hit me? I watched a video of my friends who are driving down from like San Luis Obispo uh, yesterday yesterday or the day before and well I guess it would have been the day before or it was yesterday before they closed the 101 um, and I mean they were driving through it and they had stopped at one point to see if they would have to climb down this like cliff down to the ocean uh, to try to you know in case they were, were trapped by the flames so yeah fear that's very real um, after I left Santa Barbara I actually moved to Santa Rosa and the year or two years after I left there was the big fire that, uh, you know, came into the town, I mean, into the city. And that was that was sort of a wake up call because you often oftentimes these fires are, you know, on the edges of towns or in a country or, you know, or hitting smaller rural towns and not to, you know, diminish their uh, importance or the suffering that they go through. But, you know, often, you know, they haven't made it into, you know, big cities, but um, they made it pretty far into Santa Rosa, the, the flames did. Some people have optimism that, you know, that perhaps, you know, that, that you know, um, you know, maybe this will cause people to, you know, change their ideas and views. Um, another is, and I'll highlight this, understanding the drought is a social and political phenomenon, that it's not just 
you know, the lack of water, that there are policies uh, involved in, in terms of um, in terms of droughts, climate change, uh, and so on. <clears throat> Um, so that is, you know, and then they've got their sources of, of information and how they looked at that. And that's one way that, you, whoops, I just closed out the other article. Let me bring that back up. Uh, da, 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 da. This is be Vol 21, sorry. Let's see. This is the one that I want. Nope, that's not the one. I know I can't find my <laughs> my uh. No, I can't find the article I'm looking for. My apologies. Finding every other article it looks like okay here we go so this is looking at local perspectives on <clears throat> on water scarcity on in on uh, the mexican side of the border uh, where the colorado goes to and where it often and fails so i'm not going to go into this in too much detail i'm about i can feel the smoke in my lungs so um remember i just mentioned common pool resources that was developed by eleanor ostrom and she developed this again these theories were developed inductively um <clears throat> remember she challenged that metaphor uh that that Garrett Hardin had developed the tragedy of the comments, and uh, she did that by you know the qualitative research and uh, coming up with these these common pool resources. So um, <clears throat> again, I I'm not going to go through this one. My my voice is already going. My lungs are not doing great right now. So anyway, um, that will conclude today's lecture. Uh, please be sure that you read uh, these articles. Tomorrow also, um, just look on Gaucho Space. The exam study guide will be there. Um, on Monday, we won't have, have class, um, but I will, you know, I'm I will be available on Monday, uh, basically during the class period, and may have like a Zoom um, study you know, exam review. And so I'll, I'll send out a link for that uh, on for Monday then. So anyway, uh, well, everyone, I hope you can stay indoors and not, not inhale too much smoke. Uh, have a good week.